Um, but this is not, we are not breaking the strike rules because this is a non-teaching event. It's a, an external, internal, external event uh, that uh, we are hosting here to celebrate a very important uh, book, the launch of uh, <laughs> Occupied Pleasures, which is a book by one of our um, uh, alum, alumni, alumni, alums, um, Tanya Habjuka, it's called Occupied Pleasures, and uh, she has some copies of it if anyone would be interested in, uh, in buying it. Um, there is also a very interesting article that uh, our other alumni, Dr. Tem Tembi Mooch, has written in The Guardian about this event to bring the, you know, to talk about how Tanya began to uh, think about this project, etc. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Um, Tanya Habjuka is a, um, is a photojournalist. She is an award-winning pho photographer, journalist, and educator. Her practice links social documentary, collaborative portraiture, and participant observation, which is uh, an approach to visual storytelling described as new documentary. Her principal interests include gender, representation of otherness, dispossession of human and human rights, and she has a particular concern for ever-shifting uh, socio-political dynamics in the Middle East and Palestine in, in particular. Trained in journalism and anthropology with a, an MA in global media and emphasis on Middle East politics from SOAS, uh, Habjuka produces in-depth uh, narratives that offer nuanced alter alternatives to mainstream media de depictions of her subjects. She's based in East Jerusalem. She is half Texan, half Jordanian, with Circassian uh, ancestry, and she possesses a diverse uh, background that is rich in narrative folklore, black humor, and hospitality. So our uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Tembi Mooch, who had her uh, PhD uh, at um, SOAS about a year ago, correct me if I'm wrong, That's right. is also <laughs> an award-winning journalist, writer, trainer, and educator, who splits her time between England and Tanzania where she spent time carrying field work for her PhD on women, modernity, and media in Zanzibar. Tembi is interested in questions of trust, informal communities, and interesting ways to survive despite uh, daily hardships. So there is kind of a synergy there. Originally trained as a community youth work in Whitechapel in London, she has combined journalism, reportage, documentary, and collaborative ethnography to tell the stories of groups of people who get left on the margins of the mainstream or who are displaced. She is interested in gender, land access, and human rights with a particular focus on East and Southern Africa. Besides her doctorate in media studies, which she completed at SOAS, she has training in journalism and anthropology at the London School of Economics and the University of Westminster, and she's also still a practicing journalist. Is that, you're not at Westminster? You, no, Sussex. Huh? Sussex. At Sussex? Mm. No, no, but, but you did your anthropology at Sussex? Did anthropology at LSE. Oh, okay, so there's <laughs> some wrong stuff here. Um, anyway, she, is, she has published in the Financial Times, The Independent, The Guardian, uh, British Journalism Review, Think Africa, and The Telegraph. In 2006, as part of the True Vision TV company, she was the researcher and producer of the Channel 4 program called World Without Water, which won the Prince Rainier Award for Environmental Investigative Journalism. She's currently teaching occasional courses at Sussex University and is completing a literary thriller called The Motorbike in Lobatsi, as well as several academic articles. Without further ado, I don't want to, I don't want to take more time. I just want to give you, a, you know, kind of the, uh, the way that we're going to do this uh, uh, today. First of all, uh, uh, Tanya and Tembi, very convenient to have two T's. Um, uh, uh, they're going to, uh, we're going to have a conversation between them. And then afterwards, uh, Tanya is going to give us a short presentation with photographs of her work in general, with a focus on the photographs taken for the book Occupied Pleasures, and then we'll have questions and answers. We should be, you know, we should be on time, but if we are 10 minutes, of, uh, you know, more than the time, I hope you can all stay. Thank you so much for coming, and please welcome our speakers with me. Thanks, Tina. Um, so the main thing to say is that uh, Tanya's book won the Time uh, Book of the Year Award. It won the Smithsonian Book Award. 
Uh, top, top book of top. the year. <laughs> not not um, number one, but in the group. Tanya has, uh, she's been a recipient of a Magnum Photo Award, which is the most prestigious uh, photo award possible. Um, she's exhibited around the world, including the uh, Institut de, de Monde Larabe, yes, in France, Berlin, Denmark... Dubai, where else? Everywhere, basically. New York, she's just come from New York. She's going to Denmark. Um, and so what happens two years ago is that I'm sitting, I think, probably in this room or over there, and up pops this picture of three women in the prayer position doing yoga, and it's a very powerful, resonant image. It's inner resistance. I remember it because it's quite a public image anyway. And a very earnest, lovely colleague from SOAS says in, in very intense terms, this is all about intersectionality. It's about complexity. It's about disrupting the, the, the understandings of gender. It's about disrupting the understandings of what it means to be Palestinian. And I just piss myself laughing because what I remember from eight years, nine years ago is sitting with this beautiful, wonderful, spirited, clever, funny, rebellious woman is how stroppy she was in the classes. Always arguing, always challenging, always saying, no, I've been to Lebanon, it's not like that. This stuff is rubbish, taking everybody on with no fear. And I was terrified and inspired in equal measures. So to have her suddenly in the main, kind of being the main deal and her photographs being an, a theoretical example of what it means to change how we think about uh, Palestine-occupied territories, how we think about representation. For me, that was a very moving moment, actually. It was like, blimey, she's bloody done it. <laughs> she's bloody done it. So I went home and I started Googling and I started looking up what Tanya was doing and where she was taking photos. We'd always been friends on Facebook, nothing huge. And I was literally blown away. So if you type in Tanya Habjukwa, do it, because it's a very moving and interesting journey. And I began to see that what Tanya had done from when we moved, from, from those days in 2007, 2008, is she'd taken the theory that we were learning and she'd put it right into practice. And she'd done it in little day-to-day -day ways with people, with real people. She'd taken the time to get to know people. She'd taken the time to pick apart things, to not go for the obvious. And, and to, to find ways to talk, to think about the fact that we all have multiple identities. None of us are just Arabs, just Jews, just Muslims, just Buddhists, just secular, just women, just mummies, just aunties, just educators, just journalists, just friends. None of us are just those things. We're lots of things at the same time. And that's what I absolutely love about Tanya, is her ability to see those complexities. And that, I think, is what, for me, peace and creativity and being a Jew journalist is all about. It's being able to understand those contradictions. It's by never letting ourselves descend into these ridiculous binaries, these ridiculous simplistic tropes. Because actually, I think that's how war starts, is when we stop empathising, we stop asking questions, we stop listening, we stop recognising that complexity is at the heart of it all, which doesn't mean there's some terrible travesties occurring or some terrible heinous uh, human rights being abused. But also, and it doesn't mean that we're all human and we all love each other and it's rainbow nation. I'm not saying those things and I don't think Tanya is either. But I think what she's saying as a female journalist is incredibly important. And as a feminist journalist, it's incredibly important. And for me as a journalist as well, who works in, I never do news unlike Tanya who does do news. And I don't do news because it is too simplistic and because your editors ask you to do stupid things which make me too angry. I do documentary and features and I take my time. Tanya takes her time, she gets under the surface, she stays, she keeps in contact, she shows of herself, she lets people in on Facebook, she lets people into her life. She's the warmest, most complimentary, most generous person. I, she's, you know, in a handful of up there with, with them all. And for me, also I think I perhaps understand some of the danger that she's had to go into. We do get trolled. We do get nasty, uh, offensive. It would make you cringe, some of the things that I've been sent on email, and I know you have too. And they are about our gender, and they are about taking it too far, and they are about punishing us for being women who speak out. So that's important that we... That, and, and probably for different reasons for both of us, there are ways in which being, being a woman in the world of 
reporting on conflict or documentary works to our advantage. Um, <laughs> I think she should come up here on stage with us. Yeah, you? Hey, 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 <laughs> come back, come back, yeah. Um, so I think what, what, what impresses me about Tanya's work is that she actively, every day, reinstates the narrative, has the permission to narrate, changes the way we think about things, and ultimately humanises people, because only by dehumanising them do we... Do we stop understanding and stop progressing and stop growing? I'd like to start with a quote from Professor Leila uh, Lali Khalil, who I know is an absolute heroine of yours, and who wrote the preface for the book, and then we can crack off with some questions. Um, the quote is, when war, colonialism, or extreme political violence become the scaffolding of everyday life, the obligation to remember our histories and our pasts can only be met if we have imagery with which we can narrate what has happened to us. And the work of photojournalists provides some of this imagery. We also need imagery that captures the poetry of everyday life and not only the prose of strife. So, Tanya, why did you make this book? <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a loaded question. No, um, this was a long, simmering project, uh, a culmination of years of uh, innate dissatisfaction with uh, the real practice, the real politic of uh, covering journalism in the region, in the Middle East. Um, on a personal note, uh, I had grown up uh, between Jordan and Texas, and while not Palestinian, it's a, it's a narrative that uh, one becomes very familiar with, particularly living in Jordan. And uh, from a young age, I was always... Uh, uh, really innately bothered by how it was presented within mainstream US media. So at a young age, I just uh, noted the problem. And uh, when I was 15, actually, uh, I went through a rebellious stage in Texas and was sent to live in, uh, in Jordan two weeks before the Gulf War. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was amazing, because we're talking about a pre-internet, pre-satellite uh, world, and literally, in the coverage of that war, you, you would get access to Israeli news, Syrian news, Iraq news, and occasionally, I don't even remember where it came in from, but uh, some American media. And you would have, we've, you know, the Americans, we've captured 22 Iraqi soldiers, and then you would have the Iraqis. It's all a lie. It was untrue. And it was just, uh, it was almost comedic uh, in its presentation. And so early on, the, the interest in narrative and counter-narrative began uh, fostering. But on a, on a personal level, um, it was uh, actually what drew me back into Palestine. I, I would come in and out uh, covering it as a freelancer. And one thing is there's a tendency in media to sort of trickle down and do the same story. You have the... <laughs> You have the, the media that has money, the media that has power, you know, the, the wire agencies, AFP, et cetera. But then you have, it goes down to the freelancers and they tend to sort of chase and do the same story, which to me, strategically, has always been ludicrous because if you don't have a lot of funds, you should always try to find a different way in. And also on a, on a deeper level, uh, do you really just want to reiterate the same story or try to go find another angle? And so um, initially I, I, I approached trying to find new entry points into the Palestinian uh, narrative because it was always, always grotesquely misrepresented, always. And uh, initially I did, uh, there was a period in 2009 where there was a lively drag queen scene between uh, Palestinians and Israelis. Of course, a minority group, but you had uh, uh, some Palestinians who would sneak across illegally into, uh, sadly, illegally, it shouldn't have been, but into Jerusalem and you would have Israeli Jews dressing up like Um Kalthum. I mean, it was a very special, shocking, beautiful scene. And initially, when I approached it, I, uh, you know, on the surface, it seemed like a sort of a defiance of the conservatism of Jerusalem of, of, of multiple sides. But, but the occupation informs every single element of life in Palestine. It doesn't matter if it's a cup of coffee. I mean, there's no way to avoid the politics. And so even within this, while it was beautiful and colorful on the surface, the power dynamic, um, you don't have at this point a thriving um, LGBT platform within the West Bank. You do have uh, Palestinians with Israeli 
passports have it, but in, inside there's some amazing movements there. But so there would be cases of an Israeli becoming jealous and denouncing his his Palestinian lover to his family in the West Bank. So the, the power dynamics were always at play. Um, but I think I went on a long to bring it succinctly back to occupied pleasures. Um, it was actually going into Gaza to a few months after Operation Cast Lead. And I, was, uh, I noticed another of these trends in society where everyone was describing, oh my God, women are losing their rights under Hamas. And I, th I thought it was ludicrous. Everyone was talking about the same story. But we had just had this shocking event happen, Operation Cast Lead, and you were talking about the siege, and you were talking about all of these elements affecting entire society. And I decided to sort of use Women of Gaza as an entry point to unpack this media trend. And it was while working on that story, I went to meet a, a couple that had just gotten married. The wife had just smuggled in from the tunnel. And when I showed up, unfortunately, the wife was out. But uh, for those who have been to the Middle East, you know the hospitality. You know, he invited me in. And uh, we sat there having tea, and he was a total romantic. And he was describing how they fell madly in love uh, on Skype. Uh, she was a distant cousin in Jordan. And uh, it's many Gazans that I speak to always say, for us psychologically, since the siege, thank God for the sea and thank God for the internet. I mean, that's our, how we breathe. That's our access to the world. And apparently they had some really good Skype conversations and uh, they fell in love. And of course, uh, access, how do you get in? How do you get out? It's all controlled. And um, the Israelis refused her a visa. And at that point, Mubarak's Egypt refused her. So they brought her in from the tunnel. And as he's describing the story, he's just his hands are flying in the air. He's so romantic. And he's like, you know, there she was. I found her in her white dress, dust around her hair, trembling. It was like a Bollywood movie. I ran to her. I kissed her. <laughs> and then he, he just became very somber. And he looked at me and he said, you know, no matter what this occupation does to us, no matter what they do to us, we will always find a way to live, to love, to more than survive, to laugh. And I remember when he said it, those words hit, and it was, I realized there was something there, but it took me a while to sort, sort of unpack it and come back to it. That was the beginning, though. Lovely. <laughs> um, what, the, the title, Occupied Pleasures, was it an easy title to get to? Was it obvious? What, what's that about? Did it take, what's behind that story? Uh, I, I am an avid lover of, uh, of titles. Titles get me extremely excited. Sometimes I, I get so excited and then I read the text. It was actually more disappointing than that the title was the, uh, the gift. Um, occupied pleasures straddles active and, and passive meaning. So, of course, it's a play on words, uh, the literal occupation, and then how you occupy your mind. So as I was gathering and trying to piece this together, it was when... I, I kept playing with variations, and then it was when I put those two words together that I just said, aha, this is it. And suddenly it all came into play, and the approach was very clear. Unfortunately, there was never a direct, and I, I asked some pretty, pretty high-level uh, uh, Palestinian, uh, Iraqi, various, various linguists, like, how can I literally translate with the same humor and nuance and play on words in Arabic, and it didn't work. Uh, Somebody ran it, uh, ran an Arabic article, and they called it "Forbidden Pleasures," <laughs> which had other <laughs> implications. But uh, but that's how the title came. So Tanya, tell me about when you first started taking photos, and and what what why are you taking photos, and why are you making testimonies? Are you doing it for yourself? Are you doing it to earn a living? Are you doing it for your kids? I mean, it's it's multifaceted. I certainly, I mean, this is how I I make my living. Um, as such, I mean, nobody becomes a photographer for the money. That's that's certain. <laughs> we we call ourselves sort of the modern day jazz musicians. You do it because it's a compulsion. Because you, and the type of I actually and there's increasingly more photographers that are saying this. I don't see myself purely as a photographer, but as a as a storyteller. And whatever medium is best utilized, whether it's audio, whether it's writing. I mean, there's, it's, it's exciting what's happening right now, not only in, in journalism, but in art, that it's becoming, they're, they're intersecting in really interesting ways. Like uh, recently I took a two month assignment for UNHCR to cover 
Syrian uh, refugees in Jordan, and I focused on uh, the woman who, the angle they wanted was women left behind. The women who had, you know, the men had crossed across the uh, Mediterranean to come to Europe. And I was innately dissatisfied with the imagery that I, I mean, they were perfectly fine, but they were images, but they weren't saying anything new. And I really wanted to convey the hardships, what the reality of what it was like on the ground for these women. And it was by chance, one of the last days of my assignment, I saw a distraught baby and a mother was playing from a WhatsApp message, an audio of the father singing a lullaby. And I saw the baby that was just, just irate, you know, flailing, flailing hands, just soothe. And then I, I was fascinated and I started asking other families that I met, oh, how do you have WhatsApp recorded messages? And they were like, yeah. So they started just sharing them with me. And so I put a video together and that was a way. So again, it's not just photography, it's just whatever medium it is to put across an idea. And in this video, you had beautiful messages from the fathers talking directly to their wives, I miss you, I know this is hard. You had little, little girls, Baba, I want a pink dress, I want, you know, and, and it, yeah. So it's just about finding alternative ways, new ways, fresh ways, just not to say the same tired story again and again and try to render some meaning into what you're, what you're saying. So, I mean, the political environment that you work in is often very charged, and then at a material level, physical level, it's dangerous. Uh, so how do you negotiate, how do you navigate um, representation, and how do you do all of this while being ethical as well? Um, I'm actually not in a place where I'm... I have worked environments that are physically dangerous. Uh, the elements within within the, the occupied territories, it's uh, primarily psychological, as well as it's, it's, it's a lot of it is psychological, n never knowing. There's a, there's a, a, a personal antidote. Uh, when I was first waiting, when I first was getting married, and I was literally terrified that I was not going to have my visa to stay. And I woke up at 2 in the morning shaking, and I woke up my to be husband, and I said, uh, what if the Israelis don't give me my visa? What if this, what if this, what if this, what if this? Just manic. And uh, he said, Danya, don't ever bring, bring the Israelis into my bed again. <laughs> 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 but that's, that's, that's what it is. So it's, psycho, it's psychological, and then un unless you are a Palestinian journalist, now that's another issue. But for me, no, I don't face physical. But it's, it's just, uh, how, so the question, how do you uh, negotiate the representation or... <laughs> okay. Um, you know, it's just it's just basic. I mean, you don't have to be Palestinian. You don't even necessarily have to be an Arab. But but don't be a parachute journalist. Don't come in trailing the same tired story. Use some imagination. Use some. Try to research. Try to know what you're talking about. Spend some time with the people that you're working on. I mean. So. Do you get frustrated by the close parameters of the news industry or of, of the industry that you're in? Do you get, uh, why is it so hard to get off the stereotype treadmill? I think because uh, certain stereotypes sell. I mean, the, the thing is like, and I can't believe I'm the one who's mentioning hijab, but I'm gonna mention hijab <laughs> as an example. Um, you even have in Iran and, and, and in the Middle East, you have artists who will come up with imagery, not, not only artists, artists as well as journalists, and they'll do this entire series, Beyond the Veil. I mean, how many, how many Beyond the Veils have we seen? And, or, you know, there'll be a fine art piece of a woman with a, you know, blowing uh, hijab or niqab, and it, it sells. And so in these cases, there's cases of, of people within the society selling it to the West because they're trying to get in, they're trying to break in, it, it will sell. So there's that element. Um, some people sadly just have no imagination. Um, I, I remember a very troubling, I, I won't mention who she is, but she's a famous uh, novelist and the daughter of a famous novelist that has covered uh, North Africa. And I was with her in Darfur and uh, got help her. She actually required my Arabic to help her in a series of interviews. And it was the height of the Darfur rape crisis. Well, it was more than the rape crisis, but that was exactly it. That was how it was being focused on purely, as opposed to the environmental factors and the far more nuanced elements of the conflict. And I watched how she approached the story. It was the same set of you know, few questions. It was, uh, 
you know, the sort of false empathy, oh, oh, what village were you from? As if she knew. Oh, what did you grow there? What, what, what did your family grow? And then two or three questions later, were you raped? Were you raped? You know, because she was looking to fill the pattern and tell the same story that she was doing. Um, and again, not all journalists are like that, but it's difficult because I've had story, I'm much more selective. When you're young as well, I, I've been guilty of this. You know, you want to get published. I've handed over my entire edit here. You know better than me. You edit it. You do what you want. And then you learn, especially from the Middle East, because it has, I have been misrepresented. They will choose, if I give an edit of uh, 50 images, and maybe there's 10 of, a, say, two women in niqab and three in hijab, and they will ignore the diversity of, of other imagery. It's, it's always an agenda-driven thing. So as you learn how to deal with editors and sort of resist their agenda, and I don't even know if it's an intentional agenda, you know? It's just that is how they see it. And so it's just as enforced Orientalism. Um, one last question, and then we're going to open it up to uh, the audience. Tanya's giving a presentation. Oh, yeah. right, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, so now we're going to, Tanya, you're going to give us a presentation of your photos sure, sure. and talk. Yep. Um, I'm just going to go... And then we will ask questions. Uh, actually, and, and if, if when I'm going through the slideshow, I'd, I'd hope that it was going to be kind of like you know, just going on its own, but I'm going to be standing there and clicking it. Um, I'm just going to go through several images, and I'll stop on ones that I feel have something to say. But please, very informally, uh, while I'm doing that, if anyone has any question, just, you know, shout it out. Or not shout, but kind of, hey, you know. Um, yeah? Do we need to turn off the lights, maybe? Is that okay? Do, do what? Uh, to dim the lights? Yeah. Laser projector. Can you see okay? Yeah? Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm just, I'm not going to talk about every image. This is uh, from the inside cover of the book, Ghulam. It's uh, injustice. It, I saw a graffiti scribbled on a, a boy's school in the old city in Jerusalem. Um, this image was one of the first ones that I took that I felt if you just put a single image with the, with the words occupied pleasures, it, uh, can you hear me if I stand here? Okay. <laughs> um, I feel that it's representative of the entire series. This is from Gaza and the tunnel economy, which right now has more or less been completely shut down, had changed between the last time I was there in 2009, where, uh, the ones that I went into had to be lowered and it was very claustrophobic. And it was, for Gazans at that time, the highest paid uh, job that, that, you know, so you had 17 year olds who would uh, stay 15, 17 hours in the tunnels and they were taking tramadol. It was an over-the-counter drug to sort of calm them down and because it was terrifying. You were in this very claustrophobic space and at any given point, you never knew if the Israeli Air Force would, would you know, just, uh, drop a bomb and then you collapse and you, you would die. So when I went back in 2013, um, it had become much more institutionalized and I was quite shocked to see this. Um, and another change that had happened between 2009, um, it was quite ludicrous to focus on Hamas, Hamas, Hamas. But what I saw in 2013 is in addition to obviously the Israeli siege and trauma of multiple, multiple uh, uh, wars and air uh, and, and, and serious uh, weaponry uh, on the society, you, Hamas was playing a much more invasive role in people's lives. So people were just oppressed from within, from without. I mean, psychologically, and even now it's a, it's a whole other dark level, but I've not, I'm not allowed to go anymore, but that's another story. Um, in this image, it had taken three days, and I was, I was pregnant, and I had a two-year-old waiting for me back home, so I really needed to use these days effectively, but instead I had to spend two to three days visiting um, Hamas officials, having tea to get permission to go to the tunnels, and in the end, they gave me 20 minutes, and I thought I was screwed. I just stood there, uh, had a lot of time to, to get the focus just right, because I was standing with nothing. And then suddenly this woman appeared very casually in a sort of almost banal way, just walking. And I was so shocked, I almost missed the picture. I grabbed it. And I asked incredulous, where are you going? And she said, oh, wedding party in Egypt. <laughs> and I was shocked. But then 
at that level, that, that, that jarring realization, I mean, this is her every day. This is normal. The fact that she's going through a bloody tunnel as if it's an airport terminal. So um, Tojihi, which is uh, like the high school examination in Jordan and uh, uh, across Palestine. So this was the last day of Tojihi exams. And uh, the sea, the which plays a psychological role for, uh, for many Gazans, uh, they can't both in industry, it's limited what they can fish and how far out they can go. Uh, I think it's, it always changes between five and seven, excuse the English, uh, American terminology, uh, nautical miles. But uh, so their big outing that day was a five minute boat ride. They got to go, you know, the wind blowing out for five minutes, then turn back around back to the coast. But uh, this is one of those moments. Let's see. Little girl on the beach. Uh, it's funny when uh, this was one of the images that World Press Photo used. They blew it up in a, an exhibit I was in in Russia, and they did it without the caption, which I always fight. Captions are where you can push back and fight back and get your nuance, and it's it's essential that you take the time to do that. And they didn't include the caption, and so a lot of uh, Russians in Moscow came. Oh, this poor child bride. <laughs> 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 just, just kill me. But anyway, what it was, in fact, it was, um, excuse me, I forget which camp. There's several on the sea there. But, um, sorry? Zubalia. Was it Zabalia? It might have been that. There's another one. Not Zabalia. I think that one. I think that one. Anyway, um, <laughs> she, she had gone to a wedding party the night before, and it felt like a perfect princess. And she begged her father the next day, please, please, please let me wear this dress. And so that's what that is from. Um, speaks for itself. This is the university in Abu Dis. Um, they have a javelin team, men and, and women. And of course, the wall uh, plays prevalently. Um, right across on the other side is uh, a beautiful view of Al-Aqsa, the Dome of the Rock. And it used to be just a very short drive between the two. So it's just this very, I, I sort of see these as a the Amazon woman, you know, just d defiant, but there's still this uh, block of what they can access. This is one of my greatest regrets in life. I didn't follow him. <laughs> I have no idea why, where he was going. I asked people about him and they just kind of smirked and shrugged. So I sort of got the idea that he's perhaps the village madman, but I, I, I don't know his story. I can't tell you. <laughs> Um, there's a place in Jericho called Banana Lands, and there's this, uh, they have uh, wild animals inside, they have parrots, snakes, and these fantastic backdrops. And for many Palestinians who cannot afford, because it is not easy, to, there, is no, there is no exit from the West Bank, and certainly less so for Gaza, and it's all, is, all exits are Israeli controlled, and it's expensive and stressful to go and cross into Jordan. So some people go and have these fantastic, uh, you know, wild uh, tropical journeys through the photography. You have uh, wedding people getting married, coming, and just, it's almost like a honeymoon, imaginary honeymoon backdrop situation. Fashion show, Bethlehem. This is uh, <laughs> Comment about <laughs> you the comment? <laughs> Obviously, I have to comment about this one. Um, this is the most popular picture from the series. Um, this one is where I break rank from traditional journalism and the sense of, uh, um, I argue, collaborative portraiture. Now, there is a big debate and a big divide in journalism right now that's coming up where people are talking about staging, staging, staging. Um, th for me, this outright, this is not staged. I did nothing to set this up. What I did do is respectfully include a dialogue with the person that I was uh, photographing. I nurtured a longer term relationship. I, followed, I, I met him um, a couple months before and he was just this character. He's from a small village outside of Ramallah and he wants to be an actor, although he's a mechanic. And he was just this wonderful character. And as a, as a storyteller, filmmaker, whatever, you kind of identify early on who's gonna be a good subject. And uh, we kept in touch, and purely by chance, on the last day of Ramadan 2013, I called him and I said, hey, what are you up to? And he said, oh, got to go buy a sheep, you know, for, for the family, for upcoming Eid. And I was like, oh my god, please let me come with you. And I lived at that time on very, very short distance from the other side of the wall in uh, Betanina, which is sort of the last 
still very much struggling but middle class neighborhood for Palestinians in East Jerusalem. And of course it should be, from my house, it should have been a 10 minute drive, but you've got a bottleneck situation, um, very, very uh, militarized checkpoints. And this is the last day of Ramadan. People were jonesing for their cigarette, their last meal. I mean, it was chaos. So I kept calling him, can you wait, can you wait? Finally, he said, I'm sorry, I have to go get the, uh, the sheep. And I said, please, just when you have it, call me and, and see if we can you know, meet up in time. And he did, very respectfully, he did. And as I crossed, it was empty. And this doesn't happen, unless it's like two or three in the morning. I mean, this is just a busy, damned, stressful checkpoint where a lot of inspiration actually comes from my series, just waiting and watching Kafka-esque symphony happen around me. Anyway, so it was empty. And the thing is, is to get access, these may seem like happy, lighthearted <coughs> images. But to get the trust to get these pictures, it took, I mean, some of it was just pure street photography. It's a mix inside the book that I came, took. But some of it took negotiation, took conversation in the sense of who am I? What am I doing? Pleasure? Why do you want to talk to us about pleasure? Do I have a political agenda? Do I want to say, look how good they're living? They have no problems. I mean, it, they have the right to ask these questions, especially as people who are consistently misrepresented. So, uh, this, in the case of this, this uh, would-be actor, he loved the concept. He has a, he has a wonderful humor. So he uh, had the sheep in the back, in the back of the car, which incidentally he initially named Haifa Wahbi. <laughs> oh, okay, so many of you know. And then figured out, and I never asked him how, but he figured out that it was a, it was a male. <laughs> so he said, oh, it's Morsi, actually. <laughs> he named him Morsi. And uh, as I came towards the car, he pulled the sheep in the front. And because it, he, he was playing, it was his humor, it was his, his, it was his, excuse my language here, fuck you on occupation. That's how I see it. And at this point, the light was going and I had one really inexpensive shitty light and I had to decide, oh God, oh God, yeah, I, need to, I need to light the situation. Man, sheep, man, sheep, fuck it, I don't know. <laughs> Throw it in the middle and see what happens. <laughs> so I threw it in the middle and that in itself would have been a good portrait. But I don't know, would it have been a strong him looking? I don't, I don't know, but he gave me a gift, which a good portrait is a gift, because it's a dialogue. He lit the cigarette before it was time to, I might add, oh. and uh, turned with that you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, he turned to the sheep. And that was his playfulness. So, so that is how this, uh, this picture uh, came into existence. Sonia, can I just interrupt? With yes. the, I don't know if any of you have seen The Guardian uh, online. There's a fantastic comment right at the bottom where they say, Nothing wrong with a date with a sheep. <laughs> Fair point. Indeed. Fair Indeed. point. <laughs> and as I'm going through, if I don't comment on anything, if anyone has a question, please just... Uh... Uh, this picture I put in to the book more as... When I, when I went back in 2013 to... Uh, I wanted to find the man who had inadvertently put this this into action. And uh, at this point, uh, they had become a bit more conservative, the family, the, the, the family who'd had the, the, the tunnel romance. And they didn't want to be photographed. And, but I, I kept explaining how much they'd inspired me and there was a negotiation. And of course, she didn't want a close up of her wedding picture. And then it was a negotiation. And I, I convinced them, I said, well, what if we just put you know, the, the pictures on the wall and I, I back up and I take and I show you, and I keep back and deleting and deleting until you agree. And so this was what we finally agreed upon oh. as the, uh, so that's my, my reference along with dialogue, which is in the back of the book, uh, to this uh, amazing family. So I'm just, these two pictures go side by side. And for those who can't read Arabic, uh, from, beyond, from, the, from beyond the bars I came, despite the prisoner and the jailer. So one of the most important stories that I wanted to somehow photograph was the, at that point, new phenomenon of smuggled sperm from the jails, uh, in, in Israeli jails. They are, and I wish I could remember the statistics on the top of my head, but it's a shockingly large number of uh, incarcerated men, boys, teenagers, husbands, some life sentences. So, of course, they don't have conjugal rights, despite the fact that if the Israeli prisoners, most of them do. So there's a doctor in Nablus, I believe he trained in the UK, don't quote me on that, and he, um, he's phenomenal. He does things in IVF with very limited resources that people cannot do uh, in, in so many places. And he said when I interviewed him 
that he doesn't see it as political but as feminist because he said that many of the women that, let's say that the husband's serving 20 years, she's not going to be able to have a child by the time that the men get out. And he, you know what would happen then? These men have had their life denied to them and they, and, and so he wanted to help the women. And so the thing is, is, is uh, they make a pact. I interviewed so many women who were actually pregnant or had just given birth through this process, wanted to find out how it was happening. And for one, the, they, the doctor says, talk to your imam, talk to, because a lot of these women are coming from uh, villages outside. So the imam would say, tell the community what you're planning on doing <laughs> so nobody makes any assumptions, A. And B, uh, you know, so, so there's a whole process, but as to how it happens, that magical, how the hell they get the sperm out of the jail, they make a pact, the prisoners and the woman, not to talk about it because they want to maximize how many people can do it. Mm. However, I did get one insight, because the Israelis, are, they were not happy with this, so they're monitoring. It's constantly fluctuating. But I did get one insight from a lab technician in Nablus, because he was like, oh, man, <sighs> it was such a pain in the ass taking the sperm off of that date. And I was the date, you know, I was just, I was, ah, so think about that. Think about the folds of a date. Think about how difficult that, the extraction of the semen must have been from that. But again, how do you tell that story? <coughs> so I just tried to find a respectful way. This is one of the first babies, uh, Majid, born from, uh, from this process. He's now a swarthy uh, toddler. But I loved, I also loved Lydia Ramawi as the mom. I just loved her message. I mean, I loved just how poetic and simple and powerful this political message was on her. These are, these are her little baby, what, what do you call it? Baby announcements? I mean, only in Palestine would there be such a political. Um. Dehesha refugee camp. Uh, of course, these camps, while uh, crowded, are nothing compared to the Palestinian camps in Lebanon. Those are far more shocking, but people do go up for air inside the camps. Oops, Gaza. This is another one of those funny, I don't know the real story behind this. Uh, this I, I have my, my imagination that it's two secret lovers, but uh, nobody will know. It's in this wide open space where there's no trees, but they choose to sit exactly right there, despite the, uh, the view of uh, the mosque in the background. But it's just a nice scene. There's not, you know, it was interesting. Gaza, the West Bank, that was easier to photograph than East Jerusalem. The tensions of East Jerusalem, the racism of East Jerusalem, it's really created a distrust and people are more paranoid of each other and it's, it's actually very difficult to photograph in East Jerusalem in a very depressing place. Gaza, East Jerusalem. Their house was demolished and there was a cave underneath where they used to keep the animals and the family ended up for for a long time having to move into the cave. Um, this is an old man, and okay, so wedding halls in Gaza, uh, they look like discos, many of them. And uh, this was a new one, so it was empty. And so he had it open, you know, try hoping that people would meander in and want to book their weddings there. And this is the father of the proprietor. And he was so, so old, so sweet, but he was just riled with, uh, with amnesia, not amnesia, sorry, um, Alzheimer's, and he literally, as a young child, had been displaced from his village, which, which was just on the other side of Erez. So he was a, rendered a refugee from a young age, miles away from his home, and then now in his old age, just, just under siege. So this is actually a, an image that just... Um, these are uh, these are girls from uh, high school, girls from friend's school. It's a Quaker school in Ramallah. And uh, to get access in some situations, um, especially girls, you know, they want to be careful. Like, who are you? What's your agenda? Where are you putting these pictures of me? I mean, that's the thing is uh, selfies and sexy duck faces is all the rage, including in, in, in Gaza. Once you become friends with people and you become... You've got access to their private accounts. You've got girls in Gaza, just, just endless sexy pictures of, <laughs> like, I mean, just endless. But I mean, that's all set to private. They have to be careful with, uh, so in the case of, uh, in certain cases, they would say no. 
And then I would just sit and hang out. And then, the, you know, I'm Dick Face. Do, do you have Facebook? Do you have Facebook? Yeah, yeah. So I would become friends with a lot of people. And in some cases, less so, I'll admit, teenage boys. But my friends would be like, you're going to let some horny teenage boy into your life? And I was like, yeah, well, fair enough. You know, I'm expecting to take from his life. But so in this case, they became friends with me, these particular girls, and kind of sussed me out on Facebook and then thought, oh, well, she's OK. And that's how I got this picture, which now they, they love being in the book. And uh, they're amazing girls. This, it's hard to see on the screen, but this, uh, this is the father and baby bottle. And it's funny because I was pushing uh, this image as sort of a, against the, the, the mainstream current of the, of the Arab angry male. You know, so there was like a, a sweet papa. But actually, it could kind of backfire because certain mothers were like, oh my god, look, the baby's without a helmet, Jesus Christ. You know, but this is, this is, this is the Middle East. <laughs> last moment before, uh, last moment in her uh, family home before the husband came. This is in Gaza. Ramalda nurses, or nursing students. Uh, there's a funny backstory on this one. So in 2009, right before I left, this massive story broke. And actually, I would have been guilty of being one of the journalists following the trend if I could have, because it was, it was such a telling story. It was a case of uh, donkeys that were being painted as zebras. And I mean, keep in mind, that's I mean, what you're talking about. People are trying to go on and live some semblance of a normal life. And bloody hell. I mean, humans can't get out. Do you think they're going to be able to bring animals in? And so, I mean, there was amazing cases. There was an incident at Eras where there was a woman in a jilbab, in a long coat, and she had things that looked bulky underneath. And uh, the Israelis freaked out and tackled her. What the hell does she have under underneath? And it turned out it was uh, baby crocodiles <laughs> <laughs> that had been taped. <laughs> And so, you know, so anyway, so I, I wanted to find out what happened to the donkey zebra. And then it became this obsessive mission while I was there. And at this point, what Lale Khalili, Dr. Lale Khalili would refer to the politics of pleasure. Uh, Hamas had gotten in on the game. There were more theme parks that had opened up. Like they were trying to find ways of release, blah, 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 blah. And you had, you had more zoos. So every zoo that I would go to, I would say, what happened to the donkey zebra? And everyone had this fantastic tale. Oh, it was assassinated by the Israelis. <laughs> I was like, OK, 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 what, you know. So finally, there was one zoo left in Rafah to go to at this point, And I went in prepared for de dejection. And I asked the guy what happened. And he said, oh, I know what happened. I killed it. <laughs> and I said, excuse me? And he said, yes, yes. And he saw the look of horror on my face. He said, no, 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 come, come, come. And he goes, do you see these two babies? And he said, uh, their mother was hungry. The donkey was <laughs> diseased anyway. So, so I fed the donkey to the, to the mother line. Anyway, so um, since, since this picture, there's been a couple of more baby lines in Gaza. But this particular zoo uh, was decimated in the last uh, bombardment. Uh, Funny backstory on this image. Uh, I and I don't quote me. I don't believe she's surfing anymore. She finally became old enough that it wasn't as. Although I hope she pushes back. I'm not. I'm not completely sure if she's still surfing. But at this point, she was 13. Sabah, uh, I forgot her last name right now. But uh, I really wanted to find her. But I also wanted to photograph uh, the surfers. But I was very unlucky. The entire month that I was there, there was no surf. The surfers weren't out. So this was the one day that the surf was there. And I was wobbly and very pregnant, and um, obviously not going to wear a bikini. So I was, went into the water uh, wearing jeans and a long shirt. And I went out, out. And the waves were high. And so I was really focusing on not you know, submerging below the camera, uh, the, the camera into the water. And as I'm standing like this, trying to get pictures, I felt this, I didn't realize that a wave had come and lifted my entire shirt over my belly. <laughs> and so there was a group of gawking, shocked teenage boys who were just <laughs> and all of a sudden, so I, but I didn't know. I'm just standing trying to get the picture. And then right at that moment, I felt this very soft, small hand come and pull the shirt down. And normally when someone touches you, you might jump. But it was strange. Like I could just feel this was 
this was a kindly hand. So I finished taking the picture and turned and, and there she was. She had just come over to help me and that's, that's how I actually ended up getting this portrait. Uh, these women are going up to the Mount of Temptation. This is uh, the biblical site in Jericho and it's very exciting. This is probably the most uh, high level Palestinian infrastructure, you know, touristic infrastructure that exists. And of course, the Mount of Temptation, it seems very exciting. But when you get to the top, you can buy Coca-Cola, pretty much. But I wasn't tempted, but um, let's see. And Palestinians in Gaza, in the West Bank, in wherever they are um, in, inside under the occupation, they find any element of nature to enjoy that they can. Um, these women, so basically yoga is becoming quite popular and not just among the bourgeoisie uh, women of Ramallah and Jerusalem. It's really, I mean, you've actually got men from villages, young men who are learning to teach it. Um, I should, full disclosure, I actually dislike yoga immensely myself. I'm not one of the yoga people, but uh, it's really, really become a release for a lot of people. And these two women in the front, the one on the right in the Jilbab, she uh, teaches uh, Islam in high school. And the one on the left was in her early 20s. And initially it started, they, they got a trading session and you know four or five women would come once a week. And it was this small community center, which was, which was a teeny room with a giant uh, 1970s uh, uh, elliptical, so there was no space. And then it just started growing and growing, and it got so big that they started three classes a week and doing what they called nature walks. And so they would go out in nature, and there's fantastic, I mean, the West Bank, Palestine, it's beautiful. I mean, that's the thing, and you don't, you don't get to see a lot of that beauty. And um, these, these women, uh, sometimes, not in this picture, but they like to go to areas where, around settlements. Like there's one area with some Roman ruins, and they like to do the yoga there at the risk of being hassled because they said they see it as, as inner resistance. And the woman on the right, uh, when I was watching her in, I forgot what the position is called, but it was a, it's a standard yoga position of, anyway. <laughs> and I asked her after, I said, you know, it's interesting when you, when you were doing that, it almost looked like you were in prayer, that you weren't necessarily doing yoga. And she said, well, yeah, it's the same thing for me. It feels the same prayer and uh, what I feel in yoga. This is a cover of the book and one of the last images in the book. Um, all of the nature reserves. So if you do have open air spaces in nature, uh, there's very limited places in the West Bank that you can access that have not been co-opted either by intimidation by settlers or by the Israeli Parks Authority who are very kindly managing the nature uh, for the West Bank. But of course, uh, it's, it's just straight up occupation. This particular place is right outside of the Hizma checkpoint. And the settlements nearby, these are not, um, let's say, the rabid religious settlers. So, it's, it's, so it's, it's, it's one of the less spots in nature. If you go to Hebron, any water areas there, it's, it can be really tense and intimidating. And you'll have like teenagers with I don't know, they look like machine guns. I'm not sure what guns they are, but just sort of strolling through nature with the guns. And it's, it can be intimidating for Palestinians. This kid actually came from uh, Hebron. And he had driven quite a ways to access this. So, so this particular uh, nature reserve, this is this freezing cold in the summer. It's amazing uh, pool that has fish in it and nobody, giant fish and nobody knows where they came from. And then there's a stream that goes quite a ways down and then there's actually a monastery in the back but sometimes with actual monks inside. I've been lazy, I've never actually gone that far down. But despite the fact that it's a more easy spot where you don't have as much tension, you still have, and again, I come back to the earlier statement, occupation informs everything. Um, you still have a disparity between how the Palestinian youth are treated versus the Israeli youth. So if an Israeli father or teen jumps into the pool, the Israeli referee or lifeguard says nothing. But any time that a father, a teen, any, 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 you know, would be screamed at get out of the water would be, you know, so this kid, he waited and waited and waited. And we were all asked to leave the pool. It was, it was time for the park to close. And this kid waited until the lifeguard was, his back was turned and he was going down and he just ran and did this belly flop into the water and just floated there. And just this absolute beautiful, uh, peaceful freedom, actually. So I, I love, I love this picture. And I think I will, let me see, wrap up with that. Oh.
Okay, so um, thank you very much, Tanya. I have to uh, say that uh, I owe a lot to Tanya because she provided some pictures for my first book, What It Means to Be Palestinian. We didn't talk about that. And also the cover of uh, Gaza as Metaphor, which is one of the pictures that you've seen here. Um, but uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite you to ask questions. And uh, you could ask questions of both of them, or of Tanya and, uh, uh, and of me, if you want to. But please uh, just put your hand up. We're uh, happy to take uh, um, questions. We have time for quite a few. Come on, so as. <laughs> exactly, what's going on? There you are. Rabia. Sorry about about Rabia. Uh, uh, Rabia, I think it's a new build. A uh, new Rabia. oh oh uh, Rawabi. Rawabi. Uh, okay. I beg your pardon. R Rawabi. Yeah. And do you, do you know anything about R Rawabi? And and is it likely to prov to su survive? And is it likely to 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 flourish? And there seem to be some opposition amongst. Palestinians, um, which is understandable, I guess those that couldn't afford it, because there's a, a kind of similarity with, with with London, which is not obvious at all. But after eight years of austerity, there's a big division in London or Britain itself of people who can afford new new buyers and those who can't. So yeah. it's kind of a few questions in in one. But I just wonder what what what, what you knew about it. Um, um, I've covered it. it it's uh, that Rawabi is actually one of those stories that's cyclical that every journalist does, and I've been given five different assignments to photograph it. Uh, it's actually I've, also, I've got a photograph in my book. But I didn't show in the slideshow. That's kind of a sarcastic commentary on it. It's in theory is a beautiful thing. It should be a beautiful thing. A new Palestinian city, the first new Palestinian city. Um, I remember with on an assignment with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, one of the questions that was asked is, you know, a lot of Palestinians dislike the uh, the architecture. They say it looks like a settlement. Uh, up on a hill, it's up on a hill, it's a settlement. And uh, the woman, she didn't last long in communications. She wasn't as savvy, but I actually thought her answer was fascinating. She said, and why not? Bravo. They've taken how much of our land, so if we can learn from them, great. <laughs> you know, let's take our hilltops back. Um, which is interesting because Rawabi literally faces... I think it's one or two settlements, but on another hill. And it's got this, and excuse my mouth, I used to traumatize uh, the students here. It's got this huge fuck off flag, this Palestinian flag, giant. And it's there waving right across from the uh, Israeli settlements. And it's been stolen two times. <laughs> and uh, one time they did get them on film. Of course, nobody was arrested, but uh, after that they stopped uh, stealing it. So, so on one hand, it's positive, And actually it is more affordable than, than a majority of places. I mean, land is, I mean, in Jerusalem, forget it. And uh, even in the West Bank, it's quite expensive. And, and, but the problem is the people who need it the most are the East Jerusalemites because uh, it's just insanely expensive. And they're literally, the policies are pushing, they, they want them out. They want to make it so expensive that they'll go to Ramallah and then they'll get caught and then they'll lose their ID. And so the people who need it are the East Jerusalemites, but but they can't risk losing their ID. So in some cases, very poor families that I know, one of them was a was a woman who used to watch my my children. Uh, she took a loan out, and oh sorry, she took a loan out and uh, took the place, but not to live in. As I mean, she's in this cramped cramped place. I mean, in the old city, forget about it. And not only are they just piled into these old houses, but if they rebuild them. You've got neighbors that have been arrested and to get out of jail, they have to inform on, I mean, it's just incredibly complicated. And so people will uh, uh, buy it in Rawabi as a summer home. I mean, it's, it's quite messed up. And then on the other side of things, people don't discuss the fact that there's some shady business dealings, Palestinians who were maybe coerced to sell the land. Uh, there's a lot of accusations, but nobody ever has covered that because it's always the every narrative is, wow, the new Palestinian city. I would love to see an investigative piece on it. I don't have the time or the resources to do so. 
I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Other, this, this one where, yes. Can you raise your voice, please? Yeah. Um, as someone from Gaza, I personally struggled with the idea of, especially after the last, um, the last war in 2014, I, this dilemma of do we show that life goes on and that people are resilient and are able to accommodate themselves no matter the circumstances, or do we, do we not? Because I sometimes I, I feel like when we show how resilient people are, how life goes on, it gives an impression to the world that you know people in Gaza can you know adapt to any so halas and who cares if they get four hours of electricity a day? Who cares if the borders haven't been open for uh, since the, since ten years uh, since two thousand and six? But I struggle with this idea of do, what do we do? Uh, can I say one quick thing and then I, I agree with you completely and I was terrified when this first project came out because that was my exact fear. However, it exists very grotesque, horrific imagery of what happens not only in Gaza but in the West Bank and now with the kids being shot at checkpoints because they had a knife. I mean, no, it's 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 true, and I mean, how do you? And you have such a limited, so it can't be either or, and it can't simply be, look, we're fine. You have to very carefully. But I think there's something incredibly important to refuse the binary that's placed on all Palestinians, not just in Gaza, but lately, especially in Gaza, which you're a victim or you're a terrorist. So I think you have to push back, but very carefully. But I, I that's a very important question, and it's heavy, and it, it needs to be further examined. Um, I think the word resilient and resilience, I think the word resilient and resilience is spectacularly problematic at the moment. It's, it's the language of neoliberal survivalist politics. It's used to individualize things and it's used to, um, to sort of undermine, you know, very real problems. So somehow, you know, the individual is resilient against these and if the individual fails to be resilient then the individual has failed and so resilience is used in austerity politics here it's used in palestine it's used in wars all over the country all over the place it's used in lots of different you please do contribute if you disagree i have a problem with the word resilience because how do we describe resistance change subversion adaptation rewriting it all of it without kind of falling into this neoliberal nonsense of resilience but and, and yet and yet resilience is important so it's well, difficult well in the palestinian context as well i mean some would, you know this is this concept it's part of our own narrative of survival so it's it's also it's a heavy it's a heavy word um and depressingly, I just had a conversation with the head of uh, someone I respect immensely. He comes from a very political, former PLFP, and now he's one, he's very respected in fundraising for one of the UN organizations. And he, he said, right now, there's no money for Palestine. He said everything is going to Syria. Not that it's helping that much, but uh, I asked. He said he was meeting with donors from the Gulf, and they were desperate for money. And I said, well, what's your approach going to be? And he said. Resilience. And I said, "What do you mean? That's your new approach? I mean, that's 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 our thing." What are, and he said, "That's all that I can sell. That's all that I can sell to get money." Is hey, we're still hanging on. <laughs> so yeah, it's it, it's very problematic. I mean, I, I would love to know what what you think about that further. Your ideas. Are you a student here? Uh, yeah. Can I can I intervene here? I think you know one of the issues for us is that when we. Sh you know, we have to think of the people we photograph and we have to think of what they intend to say, in a sense. So I think in different ways we can label everything as resilience or as resistance or as a coping mechanism. Um, but it does give some agency to people, I believe. Um, perhaps I'm wrong, but I do believe that if we um, show them as human beings, you know, as normal human beings, they are... Uh, getting on with their lives, the occupation is there. You know, we don't forget the occupation and we don't forget the Israeli practices. But in a way, it is a form of empowerment. You know, in a, I, 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 I always remember Edward Said's um, uh, argument uh, or statement in an article he wrote where he says the, the, the permission to narrate, we have to give the Palest Palestinians permission to narrate. Whatever we say, you know, we Palestinians haven't been given uh, that much of a permission to narrate, but we are narrating our story, stories in different ways. And so it's interesting to think of the role, and I think you started with that, Tanya, the role of photographs to tell a story. 
to tell personal stories as well as a collective story. So again, it's again what, what uh, Tembi was saying about binaries. It's not about national versus the personal. Um, they interact together in different ways. Um, and I hope that kind of explains. So it's not a question of um, life goes on. But of course life goes on. And this is what is important as well as we are still there as uh, and it's as important as uh, saying despite the occupation and i think that it's imperative because if i were just doing a series of look how resilient they are but actually i am literally if you read my contact my my content the written contact is essential for this series and it goes it's actually using black humor to explain how fucked up what they have to go through, the ludicrous situations that they have to go to. So it's actually a very pointed, uh, but at the same time, even with as much agency as I've had, because this this released this was released with the World Press Photo, so I've pushed back, but I was humiliated by the Guardian article a few days ago, because when they ran it, because I'd been covered in the Guardian before, respectfully, and I was shocked when it was uh, the headline was, uh, Palestine surfing, pleasure seekers of the occupied territories. And I was absolutely horrified. It's, 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 a, it's an important issue. And interestingly, Palest my Palestinian friends, now I'm not talking about the new shooters, but the filmmakers, the artists, the, the intellectuals, they actually aren't even interested in imagery of the daily lived life or representation of Palestinians. They're my good friends. I go to them to make sure that I'm, is this fair, is this... Uh, is this is this correct? Is this? I'm very careful with what I put out and very respectful. But uh, they say we love the work. It's important that it's out there. It has a role. But we as storytellers, like right now, the more interesting storytelling that's coming from the Palestinian artists that I know, it's post. They're so beyond documentary imagery because it's done them no good. I mean, there's just endless imagery, and so they're going into like archival research and finding, or, or for those who haven't seen the Mona Hatoum uh, exhibit, I went yesterday, right when I landed, and it it blew my mind. I mean, what she, what level she's operating. So they're going on a whole other level of post, 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 because you can only get so, you go so, so sick of how your story is narrated. And I'm sorry, I, did, did you want to say something else from? Well, let's take some other questions and then we'll come back to you, is that okay? Um, yeah. question is, um, sometimes you feel like Palestinians are so, like, especially based on their experience, they know exactly what a journalist would ask them, because they, they've been interviewed by a lot of people. Autopilot, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing is it's frustrating as well when you're hired as the photographer and you're working with a, a parachute journalist, someone who comes in and uh, like I did this week long investigation with NPR and I love NPR. They're one of the better, I guess it's like the BBC of the US and uh, BBC is not there. Anymore. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but um, the questions that he asked and the responses that he got and it would and I wanted to sometimes intervene and say, you've just given, you've just been given a pat shit answer. But, uh, you know, so yeah, you get it. And if you're, I think, a good journalist, you wait and you try another approach. And then I think that you try, you just have to sometimes accept this is what you're gonna get. And if it's factually correct, you use it. And if it's, it's difficult. No, no. <laughs> No, it was so, and that's the thing that frustrates me sometimes is because journalists who haven't been there or journalists who are really more into the dazzling, like the screaming child or the dramatic building in the background, they have that, oh, well, that's real journalism. <laughs> look, look what they did. Oh, these are nice, pretty pictures. And I'm like, oh my God, if you knew how much it took 
to gain the access and to gain the trust, and rightly so, because they do, many people, I don't wanna say they collectively, but many people feel, even if they're tired as hell, their child has just been killed. I mean, the poor woman, um, the, the kid that was burned alive, Abu Khudair, that mother was exhausted. And yet she kept seeing every single journalist that came because she wanted, hoping politically that something, and she just kept. So there's this uh, obligation to talk about the suffering, but you know, to ask, you know, it's, it's incredibly difficult. Um, other questions? Yeah. Um, I want to ask what you think of street view photographs compared to mass street photographs. I think that if you clearly state what you're doing and you clearly state this isn't journalism, this isn't traditional documentary. I mean, it's interesting because this is the debate that's happening right now in photojournalism. Uh, and if you've been following like World Press last year, they had to take a, a prize back from this series. And actually visually it was like, wow, everyone was freaking out. He got first place in daily life. And it was the series of this town in Belgium. I can't <coughs> remember the name of it, but where economically it was going to shit and all of this depravity was happening and it was this whole photo series and it was this picture um, very well lit of a man having sex with a woman in the car and you could see it was very graphic and it was part of a very and there was a woman in a cage she was like a sex worker the whole series was extremely and then uh, the mayor of the town saw it as P bad PR and he went attacking and then everyone descended upon this guy. And uh, initially the world press, because then it turned out that the picture of the guy having sex in the car was his cousin. And initially journalists were like, oh, well, you ha he has to lose the award now. And World Press was like, well, he should have said that, but at the same time, if his cousin was gonna go have sex anyway, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. But what ended up happening is, that's the thing is you have to be so incredibly careful, respectful and correct. Because if you, the minute that one thing opens and this guy, the cousin opened the door and people began dissecting everything. And then it turned out that one of the pictures in the series was actually from a town five hours away. So he had miscaptioned and he lost the world press photo. So it's, it's like, what is, but there's a pushback <laughs> right now, like Dominique Naher, uh, sorry, no, Dominique uh, Bracco just won the Tim Hetherington uh, photo award and he's doing a whole approach, it's mad, it's on another level, it's incorporating plays and theater and he did, did a fascinating article in the British Journal of Photography and he talked about how he lives with a community, he waits till they care about him and he cares about them and he believes in collaboration and that's the thing that I say, I mean, some people got angry when I used the term collaborative portraiture. Oh, well, what's the difference between that and staging? I'm like, well, a, a, a fuckload actually, because I'm not setting anything up. I'm simply being respectful and letting someone have some agency and how they, do I know him better than he knows himself or what he wants to say? So there is a pushback and there's a, some people are calling it new documentary and it's kind of like the way I equate it would be the difference between um, hard news and an editorial. So it's sort of like an editorial, it's still news, but you're sort of admitting that you're putting a say more in what's happening. But staging photography, I mean, Cindy Sherman, ah, one of the most interesting works that I've seen recently is an Egyptian photographer, Hiba Khalifa, I think her last name is. And if anybody wants to write me or ask uh, for any information after, please do. Um, I teach a workshop twice a year, and then I mentor the six months in between in, in, uh, in Beirut. And this is an Egyptian photographer, a single mother, works at a newspaper job six days a week, hardly makes any money, and despite this, uses one of her bedrooms as her studio. And she did this project that was so unbelievable. She would meet women who had pain, that whether, whether it was they were abused by their husband or whether they felt uh, insecure about their weight. I mean, whatever, it was very universal problems that women anywhere in the world would have suffered. So she meets them, she interviews them, and then she thinks and thinks and thinks about how can she make a healing portrait, combining fantasy, talking about their pain, but then have an element of release. And so everyone was kind of like at the beginning when she presented what she wanted to do, people were like, uh, okay. Uh. But when six months later she came, she presented a work that half of the room started crying, the other half started laughing, and then they would switch to, the, it was so fantastic. And that was staging. But it was, so it was this bizarre, uh, it was this bizarre element of like uh, 
like art therapy and staging and Cindy Sherman, but with far more depth. And it was, and I went to her afterwards and I said, you know, I, I want to go take a portrait in your studio. I want, I want to go get some art therapy. And then this uh, New York woman heard and she said, oh, isn't that crazy? A Westerner going to get healed and, you know. <laughs> but I mean, that's the thing is I think that as storytellers, we can keep reiterating the same tired shit, but a good storyteller, a good journalist, a good artist, filmmaker, whatever you are, you're going to push forward. So, so staging in journalism, no bad. <laughs> but again, there's just, it's just if you state what your objective is. I'd like to ask you a question, Tanya. Oh, sorry. Should, should we go first? Uh, after, after the question, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't see you. <laughs> um, I know we've just discussed this at quite a, a fair amount. Um, one of the things that I have experience for example working in Kenya with tea workers is uh, we, were t we, we ended we, I was supposed to be doing a story about uh, union rights and it ended up being a story about rape and sexual favours uh, where the women were being having to offer sexual favours to the foreman in order and in order to keep the conversation going we all ended up talking about our sex lives me included it was extremely uncomfortable there was a blurring of our personal and private lives but I felt it was it was dignified and respectful if I was going to be asking people about to, 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 to tell to talk about things that were difficult, this was done over a week. Um, then it was only fair that I should also talk. Do you do you also get to that point, that edge in your when you're thinking, whoa, you know these blur these lines are super blurred. This is uncomfortable. This presents ethical problems for me. T to tell me about it's, the thought processes that you have. It's it's and I and I'm not forgetting your question. Uh, it's interesting because it's just every photographer has their approach. Uh, my ex boyfriend. He, uh, he's two meters tall, like six foot, whatever. And uh, he, I mean, you, you can't ignore him, but he's somehow his approach is he manages to disappear and he gets amazing access. But the way that I get access is I connect with people. So it just depends on the approach. And I, uh, I'll, I'll do a, a short anecdote in Gaza, one of the refugee camps that I went to, not on the sea. I can't remember the name. Anyway, uh, I went and to a woman's therapy session, and these were women who were just really traumatized, and once a week they would come in this space. They would either dance, play, uh, play drum, uh, tab uh, tabla, they would, or talk. Uh, it was just literally the therapy was that they had a room for themselves to do whatever they wanted. And so I show up, and I'm pregnant, and you know we're talking, we're sharing of each other, and then they're like, "Oh, so is it a boy or a girl?" And I said, oh, "I don't know." I said, uh, I, "It's it's time probably I could find out." I said, "I hope it's a boy because I already have a girl, and I just I just want to know what it is, what a boy is." And and they they said, "Oh, well, you know the the doctor's visiting this week because the doctor would visit the refugee camp that week." And she said, "Well, the doctor's here. Why don't you go see her?" And I was like, you know, mortified. I'm like, well, I'm not going to take their resources and time. And I said, "No, no, 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 no." And they said, "No," and they literally drug me by the hand. <laughs> and pulled me into the to the doctor. And it turns out she was Russian. She'd been married to a Palestinian for 20 years. And she had this archaic uh, sonogram that looked like it was from the 1970s. So I get up on the table. The woman does the thing. And I mean, we're talking about seriously old equipment. I don't even know how she saw what it was. But she's like, es boy. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, I didn't even believe her, to be honest, because I was like, that, that was some shady equipment. So then I go back to the room, because all my equipment is there, and I want to spend more time with the woman. And they're genuinely, they were like, so what was it? Was it a boy or a girl? And I said, it's a boy. And they were like, I want it. And they started clapping and singing. And I just was shocked that, that they could still, con that they cared enough about me. I'm coming to take from them. I'm coming to take their story. And they cared enough to know who I was. So it just depends on the approach that you want to take. My approach, yes, I think if you're taking, you give. But then again, sometimes people don't want to, you're talking to someone in grief, they don't give a shit about your story. They're just, just be respectful, essentially. But what was your question? Thank Very you. different Thank concepts. You. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 like the young woman there, was also hesitant about coming to an exhibit about Palestinians. Um, and I'm curious, and, and it was fantastic, brilliantly done. Thank you for that. Um, but I am curious, and I've always, you know, I've struggled with this myself. So I'm curious about how you navigate the minefield of avoiding the un very undignified approach of having to cater 
or, or speak to people's racism, mm -hmm. you know, right, which is to say, okay, I want to humanize them, but not for the sake of uh, your racism or to, to be caught in that narrative, versus, you know, telling the Palestinian story. And that's why I was a bit scared about coming here at first. Um, and then my, my second question is, area, I'm, I'm neither a student nor a photojournalist, and, and my particular area of concern right now um, is decriminalizing the Palestinian resistance globally, and how do we do that? And I, I'm also wondering if, if you've considered taking a role in, you know, in, in being part of that movement to decriminalize Palestinian resi resi resistance movements and, and parties, in fact, which is in the literal sense of the term. Wow, are you are you studying law? Are you a lawyer? I, I'm an attorney. Yeah. Attorney. That's <laughs> my my husband actually he's uh, he's a lawyer and he works closely with various uh, Palestinian political institutions from the negotiation support unit w uh, and onwards. Uh, that is fascinating. I actually hadn't even considered that that movement was happening and how imperative it is. I mean, for me. We're, we're trying to have it be a global movement, but it, it's something that a few of us are very concerned with. And I, I think that you, you know you might be someone. Well, I know someone that you need to talk to, and she's a lawyer as well, and she's fantastic, and she's pushing, but she just, uh, she studied at, uh, um, oh God, um, it was one of the first uh, black universities in the US, Howard. Howard. She was headhunted to go to like full scholarship, Harvard, any, any law school, and she chose Howard specifically because of their civil rights, uh, and she's doing things, she just showed up on the scene in Ramallah, and she's unbelievable, and actually, I think you two should connect. Um, I have to be careful because, ironically, despite getting a world press photo, which is the, I, honestly, I never thought that this work would, would get there or that I would, but already, ironically, so I had this, but I, in some circles, I am seen as unhirable to tell the Palestinian story because I have made a stand, even though I did it very carefully. I, I, I see this as, I, I call it my quiet fuck you. I did my tahit, my tahit, like I, it was a smart critique. It was a quiet critique. I had to, because I, my goal was to get this narrative out. So I'm not trying to appease the West. There's a lot of Palestinian intellectuals right now, angry feminists uh, who are like, oh, fuck the West, I don't give a damn. I'm not, my, I'm not here to justify who I am. You know? But at the same time, I think there's an important role in journalism. That's, that's what I can do as an individual. But at the same time, I have to be careful not to be rendered an activist journalist because then you're suddenly diminished and you're less. So I wouldn't personally get involved, but I would document the hell out of it if somebody, and, and do an, a proper photo essay. Um, as to the other question, it's, it's tricky because uh, right now I'm working on a really fascinating project that I can't go into too many details, but it's specifically tackling Nakba and 48 for next year. And I'm working with some top academics. Uh, and it's gonna be explosive when it comes out. And it's tackling, because this project, I got funding 67. Nobody can talk about 48. That's, and one of the professors working on it is a professor at Columbia who has not been uh, tenured yet. And in the US, it's a very different climate to discuss Palestine. And so, um, why did I go down that ramble? Ah, because I was hired as one of the, the Palestinian photographers on the project. And I'm always very clear, I am not Palestinian. And I, I, you know, they decided to make an exemption because I did two, I gave two demographic threats to the existence. I have two Palestinian children. But because I am not Palestinian and because of my anthropological training, I'm very careful with how I handle the narrative of anyone that I'm dealing with. I, I just did an assignment on American settlers in the West Bank. The kid, uh, picked up a, a plastic machine gun. And before the father even said anything, I'd already put the, the camera down. I'm respectful of whoever I'm documenting. And the father said, oh, please don't take pictures of that. I said, of course not. I wouldn't do that to a pal I wouldn't, you have to be respectful. So in the Palestinian narrative, I run everything that I do. There's two, one of them is a Palestinian filmmaker, one of them, and I run everything by them. Is this problematic? How is this? How is that? I try to be as careful as I can, but people are angry and people are tired of journalists and they're tired of others coming and telling their story. So it's a minefield, I don't know. <laughs> For, 
for sure. I mean, I'll, I'll just do a quick funny story and then and get to the serious breadth of, of your question. Um, I move around, first of all, the fact that my visa is through my husband and my husband is Palestinian with an Israeli passport. So I already have more agency than the majority of Palestinians that I know. Um, but the fact that I don't look Arab, the fact that I, you know, and in fact, uh, in, in Israel in particular, because I'm Circassian, some people would think that I look Russian, and there's obviously a lot of uh, Russian, Israeli, Russian Jews. So I get through checkpoints pretty easily. Um, I remember, this is the funny story, we were running desperately late to the airport, and there's various checkpoints, or uh, checks, and I always get screwed when I travel, because in my American, it says born in Jordan, and my, my middle name is A. What is your father's name? Amir. What is your uh, grandfather's name? Muhammad Amin. Go sit down. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this one time, if, if you get stopped at the outside checkpoint and you're running late, you're screwed. You're going to miss your flight. And so hasn't my, my husband and I were like, ah, ah, you know, and as we're pulling up, he screams, look Russian. <laughs> and I'm like, so literally, I just quickly, I'm like, ah, I pull red lipstick out. <laughs> and as we're driving to the checkpoint, I'm like. <laughs> and they let us go by. Um, I, so the duality, yeah, I get access. I can do stories of settlers. I can do stories that other Palestinian colleagues cannot do. But I can also screw myself in situations. Like I didn't realize with the Orthodox Jews, that they also, uh, as, as, as well as some very um, uh, religious Muslims, that they don't shake the woman's hand. I offered my hand. The guy looked offended. He said, where are you? Oh, no, no, no. I offered my hand. He said, no, no, no. And instinct, as I would with a conservative uh, Muslim man, I went like this. But when I did that, <laughs> he looked terrified. And he's like, where are you from? Where did you say you were from? And I was like, ah. You know, I had to sidestep. Texas. I'm from Texas. Ah. Um... <sighs> It's, it's difficult. So the difficulty I can navigate inside almost seamlessly. But in terms of how I am labeled and how I am seen, yeah, it can be, it can be reductive and frustrating. And I, I don't want to name the publication, but that I recently found out that a publication that has published my work, that is sort of a publication a journalist would dream of, uh, of, of working for, and I'm in a position where I would be the natural choice to hire, they won't hire me because they don't want to be seen as, because the writer is already Arab. So the idea of having an Arab writer and an Arab woman, oh, sorry, photographer was, uh, so yeah, it's, it's difficult. Yes. Um, any other questions? You took one of the flotillas? Yeah, no, the, 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 the Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> Uh, I've, I research thoroughly before I go into these situations. And so in some cases, I, I know what I'm looking for. In some cases, then in other cases, I find something, I, I catch it, and then I analyze it later. But I've, it's interesting because one of the divisive, you know, very British colonial divide and conquer approach in, in the Palestinian context, as you know, I don't want to preach to the Palestinians here, um, but for those who don't, um, by making the suffering and restriction and reality different, you have people who kind of stop looking at the resistance and struggle for human rights collectively. It becomes instead, oh, this village I'm focusing against the wall, and this village I'm focusing on, and the 48 Palestinian is focusing on. And while, so you, it's just a matter, I mean, the best that you can do, again, 
there's only so much, but it's just context, context, nuance, nuance. And so in Gaza, you have to be very specific about but but at the same time, you have to be careful because if you say Gazan, right, purely Gazan, then they're not Palestinian, there's something. So, and again, how you get around it, you become, you become incredibly verbose, like Palestinian Gazan, and then editors are like, oh God, this woman, you know, whinges on, and they'll just cut you and reduce you again to Gazan or Jerusalem ID. But that's the thing. So. What is fascinating right now is the movement. It's connecting in a way that it hasn't in a long time through social media and through very educated Palestinians. And, and so in 48 Palestine, for example, I mean, Israelis do not, you know, some people say, where's your husband from? And I'll say, oh, he's Palestinian. Oh, oh where? You know, I'm talking about, of course, Israelis who ask me. And uh, I'll say, Ma from Tarshiha. Uh, they don't know Tarshiha. Then I have to say, Malo Tarshiha, the Jewish village with the... Oh, oh, he's Arab. And I'm like, no, he's Palestinian. <laughs> they try to take that word away. So you just, you, you, you need to, so it's this balance. On one hand, you want to talk about the specific conditions that the, the Gazan is suffering, but then you don't want to remove his identity as a Palestinian. So it's, it's just a tricky terrain. So you just try to be as respectful in the terminology as you can. But what's happening right now in 48 Palestine is you have like, there's the Mahatta that's just opened up in downtown Haifa and you have uh, the youth who are using what they call the, the tool of citizenship to resist. And they're using like um, cultural activities and then they're going to, and it may seem on one hand, they're gonna go party in Ramallah, but no, they're reconnecting. And so there's some fascinating movement happening forward on that terrain. Um. Maybe if we don't have any more questions, Tembi has one question, yeah. and then we have time. If you want to buy the book, mm -hmm. uh, you can have a signed <laughs> copy. Um, but um, Tembi, please. Yeah, go just ahead. drawing it round. So the kind of original idea that you know what we're looking at is the uh, permission to n to narrate, the permission to let people call the shots at some level. Um, I'm thinking about um, when I was doing some. Do I was doing a documentary and. One of the things that became clear when we were talking was that people kept using... They, they would put their phones out on the table in this really sort of ostentatious... And then they would look at mine and say, you're a Westerner, you come from Europe, you've got the cheapest phone, what's that about? Like, he's trying to do some kind of, un, you know, sort of statement. And so the phones would come, and phones were this... It took quite a long time for people to admit what they were doing. They were flirting. People, These are younger women, you know, 17, 18, they're having... They're having little numbers going on with their texts and their little little flirts because it's absolutely not okay for them to be flirting in public. Um, so I just I I found you know kind of letting like exploring the humour of that, exploring what they were flirting about, what people wanted to talk about. That was like a really it became really funny, and then it became a kind of. Then they were asking me, like, why do Westerners divorce so much? Why are they so unfaithful? Why are they so crap at keeping their pants on? Like, which to me was hilarious. Like, it's actually really funny to have the thing thrown back at me. And I think that the media can be very transformative. It can, it can give people agency. And I'd like to know about how you view that transformative power, if you like, of your photography, of, of giving people agency. What, what have you seen that's changed and people, the way that pe people change the conversation? I, I can't say... That, that I've given anyone agency, I can't say that. I can say that after the project came out, I, I would receive emails, sometimes just one word emails that would say thank you, or thank you for letting us be seen as we are, thank you. A lot of them were Palestinians in diaspora who can't access Palestine. Um, I, I, I think what I can do is open up the space, it's, if, if that's agency, I don't know, but I can open up the space for conversation in places, I mean, I've discussed Palestine in places you wouldn't expect. Um, but what I think is interesting that is happening is because of social media, again, uh, I remember the first time I heard these words were from Dr. Dina, top down, <laughs> the traditional top down approach uh, in journalism is being countered uh, because people can talk back and they can critique. And I refer to a World Press win in 2006 where the image of the year was an image from uh, the war in Lebanon in 2006. And it was this image that was initially problematic how it was captioned. It was this image of a very attractive uh, Lebanese woman, uh, blonde, blonde, tight white shirt, very, <laughs> and uh, they're in a red orange convertible. It was two very attractive women and a man, and the woman is sort of leaning out like this. And it was initially, there wasn't enough context, and it, it came across as wealthy voyeurs coming to look at the damage from the war. 
And what ended up happening was uh, in the, the photographer in question won the world press. And it, it is a very striking image. But at the same time, you have a political obligation and an ethical obligation to give as much context as you can. And so the people actually wrote back. And it was, went very public. And social media played a role in this. And they were like, hey. Oi, no, that's not what happened. We were in and out of, uh, uh, why am I blinking? <laughs> we were in and out. My, my aunt, an old woman, refused to leave. We kept risking and going in under bombs to, to give her food and to help anyone that we could. We're part of the community. How dare you reduce us to, and, and it ended up creating this massive dialogue. So. I don't know if you can give agency, but you can open up dialogue. And I think the agency is being taken. You're seeing a rise in some phenomenal Arab filmmaking, Iranian Arab filmmaking, uh, uh, arts, journalism. People are taking their narrative back, and that's exciting. And also on another note, you know, this, this whole, and I'm going on a little side diversion, but this whole uh, Shia Sunni uh, divide that's being shit stirred. I mean, when I, when I, when I first went into Iraq, um, people, journalists around me at the beginning of the occupation were saying, are you Sunni? Are you Shia? They were asking every single, and people were taken aback initially because you didn't ask that question. And I actually had a friend who was like, you know, when my aunt was visiting in uh, Europe, a great aunt, and she died, the imam asked us which she was because apparently there's slight different uh, burial rituals and literally didn't know we had to call and check with this you know so so it's been it's being fostered but interestingly enough like uh, I just got an invite from to go to the Iran uh, Iran Biennale so so there's some interesting dialogue happening that's that's so that there's a form of agency in that I, th I don't know how, if there are there any journalists or wannabe journalists in this room yeah Good. Nobody wants to be. A Nobody. Wants wait, wait. To be a you're you're a with that amazing magazine, right? Are you oh, Al Jazeera. I mean, I, I don't. What I would say is, if you want to be a journalist, if you could be a journalist, if you know journalists, if you want to be a photographer, blah 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 blah. I there's a big backstory to this to this thing that you know Talia and I have been working on with the Guardian, which we're not going to go into. It's been a very it's been very hard work to get to change the story. And I think it's just, I think the difficulty is, I mean, time is at a level where you can probably call the shots to a to some degree. But there's still a lot of haggling, horse trading, fighting. There's still an element of, you know, I've been doing this job for 30 years now. I still am worried about not getting the next call. I'm still worried about the thing that you've talked about, which is the person saying, we're not going to we're not going to hire her. She's too activist. She's too political. She's too difficult. She's too emotional. She's too what, 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 what. And the thing is, actually, you have to still find ways to say, I will tell this story in this way because this person 3,000 miles away, I owe it to them. I've got an ethical, intellectual duty to say it in a way that works for them and not for Tristram in the news agency in Britain who has never stepped out of Chiswick. And that is a real... To, for me, that's the battle. That, that, you know, of kind of... I am not going to let my fucking world be defined by somebody whose parameters are this big and who speaks one language and I speak four and you speak three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So that, in a sense, it is quite ongoing and it's active and it's not the big moves, it's the little moves, it's the little fights, I think. If anybody wanted to... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, and Yeah, actually, the, the Guardian article, I almost didn't want to come to SOAS because, <laughs> because yeah. first of all, that, that headline. Yeah, that <laughs> and headline. second of all, they, they literally took one of my quotes where I talked about how when covering Palestine, they never put enough context of the militarized checkpoints and limited, and they changed it to say, they focus too much on the checkpoints. And they, they literally changed my quote. I was like, I'm not going to SOAS. No, it wasn't SOAS that changed it, it was the Guardian that changed it. That, that, that's my point. I do, as long as I was like, that, that is humiliating, and I couldn't, it took a lot to get them to correct, but they did make a correction. But um, for the staging question, we actually have a photo industry person here, if she wants, <laughs> from Panos, which is one of the most kick-ass photo agencies. Of all of the photo agencies, they really have an ethical uh, humanitarian agenda, unlike the others. If you wanted to say anything about your take on staging, you could. Does anyone have the microphone? Where's it gone?
I'm gonna give my first one from staging. <laughs> uh, not really. I think I really like what you said about Palestinian artists. We, we decided to move away from documentary because it didn't do anything good for them. And I really think that um, people and saying that staging photography come from the statement that photography is true, and I really hmm. disagree with that. I think it gives too much power to the photographer, and it kind of blurs the line and makes people forget that actually a photographer is framing a situation and, and is taking a decision in that moment of excluding things out of that frame. And that can't be the truth, because it's, it's just a representation of his vision. So I think this is like, this is often this is the starting point of people that are really against staging and photography that are saying that we can't lie to the viewers and I really agree with that. It's, it's really about being open, but it kind of make people forget that the photographer from the beginning is telling us his point of view and, and the way he's seen the situation. Um, and I think in that sense, if you're open about the fact that you are staging, you may be more true to the viewers. Yeah. Because they will know from the beginning that they put you in a theatrical uh, environment. You, they, they bring you into their imagination and their own interpretation of the situation. And, <coughs> and maybe that leaves more way and space for yourself to think about what you're looking at, rather than taking it for granted and thinking that's the truth. That is uh, really good, and I'm going to say thank you. I'm so proud of my of our two uh, uh, al alumni, correct? Ducklings. Is that how you say it? Ducklings. Sorry, I think of ducklings. Yeah, ducklings. well, well, they're <laughs> <laughs> they're more than, than ducklings, and um, and uh, I'm really proud that uh, some of our current students are here. So maybe you uh, have uh, learned some more. Uh, what happens I, to you I, after I, you can have I, can I say one quick thing? After you have a degree from SOAS and so and Dina and SOAS and the endless reads and all oh, theory and it was agonizing and there were times <laughs> I questioned why. But I have to say that yes, the time here allowed me to feel confident in deconstructing and actually having my own voice. So thank you. SOAS definitely played a role. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dina. Oh. Thank you very, very much, Dina. I interrupted, I'm sorry. Thank I'm you sorry. all for coming. Do you have, how many books do you have? Uh, I think like 10? 52. <laughs> 10 books. Yeah, so if, if anybody wants to buy the books, uh, they're also available. Can you buy them on Amazon? Un unfortunately, Amazon in the US only. So you could order Amazon, but it has to be Amazon US. Okay. But uh, yeah, so if you want to go through Amazon or the 10 copies I have here. And thank you so much for coming on a lovely day and in the middle of the day. So thanks. <laughs>